the 20th of June, millions around the world watched a young woman die on the streets of Tehran. The phone images had been uploaded onto the internet. That look still challenges me. It had a message in it. I don't know what it was. The blood that came from her chest and mouth, we must remember that blood. I mean, seeing it outside of Iran, it's scary. But when you were actually there, and you, you think to yourself, I could be her. This is disturbing. I want everyone to know that. But this is possibly the most seen piece of video out of Iran in the world. Filmed at the height of protests shaking Iran, it immediately became worldwide news. In every life a moment comes that the integrity of some person would be tested. And I realized on that day that this was the moment in my life that I, would, I had to choose whether to uh, keep myself safe or uh, prove my integrity. Pictures of the death of Neda Sultan, an Iranian who was caught up in a demonstration, have appalled people around the world. Ever since, the Iranian regime has fought to explain what happened. But you're not. We want to say it's a scenario that was just pre-designed. Pre-designed. You think it was a pre-designed that she be killed so they would have it on tape? Yes. Definitely so. We have no doubt about it. This is the street in central Tehran, where Neda Aga Sultan was shot this summer. Three months later, our cameraman risked arrest to film the place where she died. He looks for a spot of green paint on the road, a sign of the protest movement that filled these streets in June. To keep her name alive, Protesters graffiti the walls, but the authorities keep painting it out. In death, Neda has become a symbol of the opposition in Iran and of the 80 or more protesters who died after the disputed election. This film explores the significance of her story and why the Iranian regime tried to suppress it. The government, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is afraid of anything to do with Neda and her memory. I'm sorry to have to say this, but they are even afraid of her gravestone. Neda's boyfriend, Caspian, was arrested shortly after her death and kept in prison for 65 days. Despite a climate of fear in Iran, Neda's family have also told us all about her. She was 26, with a younger brother, Mohammed, and an older sister, Hoda. As a schoolgirl, she was top of her class. She was a theology student, but disagreed with the course and only lasted three terms. She'd married young and divorced. Just two months before her death, she met Iranian photographer Caspian Makan on holiday in Turkey. We both love Turkey. We even had a flight booked. We planned to come to Istanbul for a few days. 
and then it happened. The story of Neda's death starts with the June 2009 presidential election. Neda was desperate for change. Her sister Hoda wrote to us from Tehran. She used to say, as we all do and know, that there is a dead, depressing air all over Iran. It's everywhere. It's in people's heart. We are condemned to depression. We are condemned to living without being able to breathe. Neda was skeptical President Ahmadinejad would be allowed to lose. Neither she nor Caspian intended to vote. But opposition leader Mir Hossein Musavi was gaining massive support. For those who disliked Ahmadinejad, he was a realistic alternative. Neda's friend Delva Tabakoli decided she would vote. I always thought the way of saying no was to boycott elections. This time I had a different feeling. I was encouraging everybody to vote. Either for Karubi or Mosavi, it didn't matter. Neda wasn't a supporter of Mosavi. It was a protest vote. One cannot say it was in support of a candidate. It was everyone voicing protest. As the so-called Green Movement surged around Musavi, this was no longer the election foreign journalists like Scott Peterson had been let in to cover. Tens of thousands of people on the streets uh, for their candidate and for both candidates. In fact, it was an extraordinary uh, build-up to the election. But there was deep distrust on both sides. Just a few days before the vote, there was a rumor that, that uh, swept the uh, text messaging system, and that was that Ahmadinejad's people had imported two million pens with disappearing ink. But it was like, go to the polling stations with your own pen, um, go between these hours and uh, go in the morning, don't leave it till night, don't go to um, uh, the mosques, vote in schools. Iranian journalist Faranak was one of hundreds of thousands who, despite their worries, came to believe the opposition could win. Iranians get, tend to get very emotional before elections, and this time, you know, they were like, leave alone the emotions, let's be logical. We, none of us really like Musavi or Karubi or Ahmadinejad or Rezaei, but we have to get rid of Ahmadinejad, or our country would just be a wreck. There have been queues here since polls opened early this morning, despite the fact that being a Friday, today is the day most people like a lion in bed. Not today. Everybody in Iran wants to have their say. This election has enervated, excited and divided Iran. And they have quite a clear choice between the conservative option and the change option. I was excited when I picked up my ID card and went and voted. In the evening, when I found out a friend hadn't voted, I took her to the polling station and made her vote. But fear of vote rigging discouraged opposition voters at the polls. And her sister tells us Neda was among them. Neda went to a couple of polling stations and was told that neither Musabi or Karubi's representative were present. She tried to vote, but wasn't able to. Opposition supporters said they couldn't trust the Interior Ministry officials manning the polling stations. More alarming were signs that government paramilitaries, the Basijis, were being mobilized. Late afternoon of election day, the Basij militia struck, entering Musavi headquarters. An eyewitness filmed on a camera phone as police tried to remove the Basijis, but they said they had orders to shut the office down. <laughs> 